Good morning. Good to be here under the sunshine at this Sabil conference in this setting. It's great to see so many friends from Sabil, from Wuhan, but also internationally. <coughs> and actually, it's for me uh, an honor to be able to reflect on the empire in the light of the word of God, but in the shadow of the world. And when, while I was sitting there, actually, I was looking at this tower and the soldier behind, and I was hoping that they might open uh, the windows because they might learn something. <laughs> but I think they are too afraid to do that. So let's pray that uh, their fear will be overcome one day and they start listen. When Sabil called asking me to do the devotion today, and actually they said it would be good to do something on the wall because of the setting. I thought and thought what to choose. Uh, I could have chosen the first reading that we heard today from Ephesians chapter 2 where it says uh, Jesus is our peace who really knocked the wall down. I thought also maybe taking uh, Psalm 18, where it says, with your help, O Lord, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. It fits very well maybe with what's happening in the Arab world today. But rather, I chose Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. As you know, this text is taken from the Sermon on the Mount by Matthew. But still, this verse 5, actually, if you, if, you, if you think about it, within the Sermon on the Mount and within the, uh, the first 11 verses, it's a marginalized verse it's very seldom that it gets any attention. I mean, think of it. Blessed are the peacemakers. You hear it all the time. But we seldom hear about blessed are the meek. They will inherit the earth. This is why even Luke doesn't mention this verse. Actually, he skips it. If you read Luke chapter 6, it's not there. He talks about the poor, and he talks about the hungry, and he talks about the thirsty, but not about the meek, which is interesting. There is no mention of the meek. Maybe because they are meek. <laughs> but actually, I think we don't talk about it much because it's very difficult to spiritualize this verse. You know, when you uh, hear, blessed are the poor in the spirit, they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's very nice, you know? It's so spiritual. You can say anything about it you want. Not about the meek, because it talks about the earth, something very concrete. So you cannot just spiritualize it and say the earth is the kingdom of God because it doesn't say the kingdom of God, it says the earth. But also maybe this verse is marginalized because also I believe it was translated wrong to start with. Because originally this verse is actually taken, Jesus was quoting Psalm 37. And there it doesn't talk about the earth, it talks about the land. Not one time, several times in that Psalm it's repeated. So basically, 
It should read, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the land. Does it make better sense? Maybe not. But actually, the sign 37 is not talking about the lands near and far, as we sung in the song now. But it talks about this land. The meek will inherit the land. Everyone at that time and everyone at the time of Jesus knew what actually is meant by the land. It's this land. It's the holy land. It's Palestine. When they translated the words of Jesus from Aramaic into Greek, they twisted the word, which means the land, this land, to read the earth. And it doesn't make sense once it reads the earth. In fact, in Arabic, the word ard means both. When we say al-ard, we actually talk about this land, but it could mean also the earth. But Jesus was talking about this land. And by the way, this twisting of the text of the Bible, it happens all the time. The gospel is very much connected to this land. But how do you want to give it a meaning for the whole earth unless you sometimes you need to twist it? This is what the Greeks did in the first century and the second, with good intentions because, you know, why should somebody in Greece worry about who will inherit this land? He should worry about his soul and maybe about his land, but not about this land. And this is why I think early on, one of the church fathers said that there is a fifth gospel beside the fourth gospel, and that is this land, the land. Actually, we cannot understand what the Bible is saying if we do not understand the topography, the geography, the geopolitics, the history, the spirituality of this land. And I think this is why it's so important that we are meeting here in this setting. Maybe we can understand more. But I would add, there is also a sixth gospel, if we really want to understand the Bible, and that is the people of the land. The land alone, the fifth gospel alone, is not enough. I think we have to start listening to the Bible with the ears of the people of the land, in this case, the Palestinians in general, and the Palestinian Christian in particular. But, okay, let's read it with the ears of the Palestinians. Would it make more sense? Blessed are the meek. They will inherit the land? Not really. You know, I struggled with this text for so many years. Does it make sense? And those of you who know me, I don't like to spiritualize things. Because I think Jesus was very spiritual because he was very talking always to reality not avoiding reality. This is why he was so spiritual. So, does it make sense? Actually, for so many years, I was all the time thinking Jesus is mistaken. You need only to look around you and you know who controlled the land. In fact, this is why I didn't choose anything about the wall, because the wall is not about separation only. It's a land grab. It is built in such a way in the West Bank, not on the Green Line even, 90% of it is, is built inside the West Bank, to take from the Palestinian so much land that is worth hundreds of billions of dollars. This is what we are talking about with the world. If you look at the settlement Zogbe was uh, referring to, the settlements are nothing but to control the land. This is why they are built on the top 
of the mountains. They control everything. They control the movement of people. And they make sure, actually, that there will be no Palestinian state in the future. So listening to the words of Jesus through Palestinian eyes doesn't help us, it seems, give more sense to this verse of Jesus. Jesus is mistaken. The military occupation is in control. They not only control the land, they control the resources, the water, the electromagnetic fields. Everything is controlled by the empire. So, Jesus is mistaken. The empire controls the land, not the meek. And the empire controls the land, in this case, by proxy. Jesus is mistaken. The meek are crushed. If you saw yesterday the news, what's happening in Libya, they are crushed. Not only by Gaddafi, by the way, but also by Israel. Jesus was mistaken. And I think this is why Luke didn't want to bother, actually, to have it in his gospel. But in the last three years, while struggling with this text, I came to read it with new lenses, and I think maybe now I have discovered actually the real Palestinian lenses to read this verse with, that it will make sense. And then, actually, I think I did, I discovered something that is very powerful more powerful than we think. I came to understand that this verse, Matthew 5.5, 5, actually speaks directly to reality in a way we would never imagine. How? Only if you read this text, not with a lens, with a close-up lens, but we have to put on a wide lens. If we just have it with a close-up lens, a tele-objective, basically, we will never understand what it means. And I think this was exactly our mistake, because we were always reading Matthew 5.5 5 in the light of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And if we take only the last 60 years, it doesn't make sense at all. Jesus was totally mistaken. But I think Jesus, when he spoke this, had a wide lens on. Because he looks at history with a different angle than we usually do. So, let me help you put on this wide lens. And you will be amazed, actually. I learned after this struggle, actually, that we have to read this text not only from the last 60 years, but we have to take the 3,000 years, the last 3,000 years, all at once. And now look, we have a long history with empires. There isn't one single regional empire that did not occupy our country. The first empire to occupy our country were the Assyrians, 722. They came and they stayed for over 200 years. After them came the Babylonians, 587. They didn't last long because they were pushed by the Persians. 538. Also, they didn't stay for too long because they were pushed by the Romans. The Greeks, sorry, the Greeks. Then the Romans. Then the Arabs. Then the Crusades. Then the Ottomans. 
then the British, and last but not least, Israel. You see, we were always trained so naively to connect Israel of today with the Israel of the Bible. But actually, how we should do it is we have to connect the Israel of the Bible with the Palestinians because these are our forefathers. And to connect the state of Israel with the empire. It makes a total different sense. Think about it. Which of these empires lasted here forever? I know them. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Crusades, the Ottomans, they came, they stayed for 50, 100, 200, 400 years, and they were all gone by the wind. You know, when you stand in front of the empire, you cannot believe it. Often I think our problem is that we really think that the empire is there to last. And actually Jesus wanted to tell us, you know what? The empire will not last. They will all come and go, and who remains in the land? The poor. Those who have it, even from the people of the land, they will immigrate. They will become part of the empire. Those who are well educated, they go, they seek a job by the empire. Who remains in this country? The meek. Empires come and go. The meek, they inherit the land. Think about it. How wise Jesus was. It seems to me we were somehow blinded by a Western theology that didn't help us really understand what Jesus, one of us, was saying. But you know, some German theologians tell me, no, Israel is different. Look at the settlement. How can you say they will be gone? Look at the wall. How can you say it will be gone? You know what? If we lived at the time of Jesus, and so all the military checkpoints that Herod the Great created, and you look from your hotel towards the east, and you see Herodion, and Masada to the south, and it, go, it went all over. No one at the time of Jesus would have imagined that Herod is not there to stay. If you look at all the settlements the Greek built, Caesarea, I mean, that is, today it's a big city. I mean, if we look at just the ruins, imagine at the time of Jesus. Jesus was saying, you know, even the Greeks who built Caesarea, they are not here to stay. They will be gone because this land will be only inherited by the meek. Is this a cheap hope? Is Jesus telling us, you know, like some fundamentalistic groups, let's wait 400 years, Israel will be gone? I don't think so. What he wanted actually to see is that through that one first, he wanted to release us to release us from the power of the empire. The moment Jesus spoke that word, the empire lost its power over us. This is actually what we are experiencing today in the Arab world. These millions of young people, they lost their fear of their empire because they really got it that the empire is not there to stay. 
you can come close to the wall and you can start chattering it because it will be gone and God will not do it alone. He will do it only with us. Amen.